This is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype from Los Angeles with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Great to be with you as always. Before we move to the Middle East, let's begin in the United States this week. Quite a week it has been, many of these events of prophetic significance. Once again, Conservative Americans, American Christians, pro-life American voters have been lied to by the Republican Party establishment. Illinois Governor uh, Bruce Rauner, who ran on a pro-life platform and who promised Christians, promised Catholics, promised any kind of pro-life advocate that he would veto legislation from the Illinois State Legislature and Senate for public funding of abortion has lied, has broken his word. Illinois Republican Governor Bruce Rauner signed a controversial bill into law on Thursday to expand state-funded coverage of abortions for low-income residents on Medicaid and state employees. The bill, approved by the state legislature in May, would also keep abortions legal in Illinois if the U.S. Supreme Court follows President Donald Trump's call to overturn its landmark Roe v. Wade ruling that made abortions legal 44 years ago. Illinois' Medicaid program has previously covered abortions in cases of rape, incest, and when a mother's life or health is threatened. The expansion would enable poor women to obtain elective abortions. The bill would allow state employees to have the procedures covered under state health insurance. Rauner, who had earlier suggested he would veto the measure, said in a statement that he had talked to women around the state before making his decision. Directly and outwardly, signing into law what he said he would veto, requiring taxpayers in Illinois to fund abortions. Well, obviously, these unpaid for abortions that the taxpayer will pick the tab up for performing in the killing of these unborn babies, most of them, of course, will be black American. Uh, the Republican Party joining in the policy of the Democratic Party to cull the population of black America by the use of abortion to keep the black population down. Illinois, of course, is plagued by welfare, uh, much of it in the black community, and it's plagued by urban crime, much of it black on black, or most of it black on black gun violence and gang-related and drug-related uh, gang violence. Peter Kirstenau is an attorney. He's a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He's a regular guest on this show. He saw that segment last night. He objected to it, so we asked him to come on and explain why he did. Peter Kirstenau joins us tonight. Peter, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. So what was um, your contention with that segment last night? Almost everything that you just played was false, inaccurate, and based on a false premise. Um, and it's a false premise that's been perpetuated for quite some time now. There's no doubt whatsoever that this country has a baleful history with respect to race. Blacks have been yeah. discriminated against in egregious ways. People have been killed, and it's something that's been relatively recent. And it's, there's no doubt that blacks have been targeted by cops. In a nation of 320 million people, they're going to be racists, and some of those are going to be cops. But for the last 30 years, that premise that blacks are disproportionately targeted, arrested, shot by cops is completely false and all you have to do is look at the Department of Justice statistics. And We've looked at these kinds of things and the Civil Rights Commission, there are copious studies on this. Just for example, uh, and this is pretty bad, frankly, the Justice Department stats show that blacks are in fact killed two and a half times more often than whites are by policemen. Huh. However, when you take a look, at, remember that statistic, two and a half times more frequently, but that's far less than what the data would predict given black crime rates. 
Take New York City, for example. Blacks are now two and a half times more likely to commit crimes. Blacks in New York City are 35 times more likely to commit robberies than whites, 38 times more likely to commit murders, and 51 times more likely to engage in shootings, regardless of whether or not it results in a homicide. So when you think, think about two and a half times versus 51 times, the type of police involvement that you would expect from those kinds of stats is far below than what would be predicted. And that has consequences in regard to what's known as the Ferguson effect. What we saw is, and Heather McDonald, the great scholar from Manhattan Institute, has done a number of uh, studies on this, great work on this, testified before the Civil Rights Commission showing that because of these protests and the consequences of it, police withdraw from active and proactive policing, and sometimes the city administrations tell them to, as we saw with the mayor of Baltimore, the Obama administration had consent decrees which changed police practices, so police withdrew from active policing. That consequence is profound because despite the fact that we've had decades of a decline in the crime rate, right after Ferguson, we saw a significant spike in violent crimes, most especially in those cities which witnessed the types of high profile shootings and protests that resulted in police drawing back. Except for, this is very interesting, Pew studies showed that 72% of police were less engaged in proactive policing as a result of this Ferguson effect, except for one cohort, black cops. Black cops are 3.3 times more likely to shoot black suspects than white cops. But even so, when you look at the correlative crime data, that is black involvement in crime versus police shootings, the number of shootings are far below that which would be predicted based on crime involvement. And when you have the false narrative and you've got this perpetuation of all these protests and it causes the Ferguson effect, here's what the consequences are. Take a look at the data, despite the dramatic uh, uh, decline in crime rates. In 2015, 900 more blacks were murdered than in the year before. In 2016, 900 more. So we had 7,881 blacks killed in 2016. The vast majority, more than 90%, by other blacks, not cops. That's nearly twice as many as the number of soldiers that were killed in the entire Iraq war, and it's at least partially a consequence of this false narrative feeding this outrage, which then feeds the protests, which then results in a Ferguson effect, and then the, sp the spike of the crime rates. Most of the people, I think, in goodwill may be ignorant of those facts and believe, subjectively, I've been pulled over by the cops, and if you talk within your own little universe, you believe that maybe you're being subjected or treated differently, except when you look at the objective facts. Most people, in good faith, probably believe, but are ignorant of the fact that, in fact, uh, the narrative is false. But the, there is a cohort of individuals, some politicians, some, some yeah. political opportunists that are using this for a political imperative that's despicable because we have bodies on the ground. I don't think I've ever done a segment where I didn't say one word because I was so mesmerized by what you were saying. I don't, can't remember someone with a, that kind of command uh, of the numbers. Thank you. Peter Kirsten, I'm really glad that you came on tonight. Thanks, Tucker. I hope you will come back anytime. Thank you. Well, there is actually a scandal tonight in Washington. It does not involve Russia. Maybe that's why no one wants to talk about it. Bob Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, he's in trouble. We'll tell you what for. Stay tuned. In Chicago and even in other cities in the outskirts of Chicago. Uh, again, the solution of the Democrats has traditionally been to abort as many black males as possible or black children as possible but now, of course, this pro-life governor was not pro-life. He was a true Reagan Republican. We're recalling how Ronald Reagan lied to Christian America, saying he was pro-life, only to stab them in the back when he appointed Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court, uh, a pro-abortion judge, who, of course, later went on to write the decision to remove the Ten Commandments from the Judicial Building in Alabama that caused Judge more his position as Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court in Alabama. Thankfully, Judge Moore was elected to the U.S. Senate, running against the same Republican Party establishment. And we got a little ways to go yet, but tonight we're so honored to be able to have with us a special guest that's going to introduce the judge. 
We've got one of the most conservative thought leaders in America with us tonight. You know him nationally. You've seen him on TV. He's been in the White House. He's now heading up Breitbart News. Help me welcome Mr. Steve Bannon. I, I told you all last night that a vote for Judge Roy Moore is a vote for Donald J. Trump. And I want to thank all the good folks in Alabama for supporting Donald Trump today by voting for Judge Moore. As you all remember, last night we talked about starting a revolution with Judge Moore's victory. Well, Senator Corker stepped down today. He's not going to run for re-election. And you're going to see in state after state after state, people that follow the model of Judge Moore, that do not need to raise money from the elites, from the cr crony capitalists, from the fat cats in Washington, D.C., New York City, Silicon Valley. This campaign was outrageous. $30 million spent against about two and a half, all in the politics of personal destruction against one of the finest men in this country, Judge Roy Moore. The question was called today in the state of Alabama. Who's sovereign? The people or the money? And Alabama answered today, the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you see my family up here, my sons, uh, Caleb, Roy, and Taya, Roy's wife. Uh, of course, my wife. I've got my young mother of 90 years old standing down here. I've got my brothers, my sisters, uh, and I appreciate all the people that come tonight. Uh, I want to I want to get my staff up here just a moment, if you will. The people that worked on my staff, if they'll come up here, Brett, Drew, Thomas, y'all come up here a minute. Just give them some room. Dean, you know there's so many people that worked on the staff that should be recognized. Uh, Thomas here is is done. Thomas Sparrow has done a wonderful job. I like, to t I like to say I taught this guy to run, but I didn't. <laughs> this is Saran Stacy. He's done a great job. And of course, my chairman. <laughs> Got to have a chairman, and this guy's the best in Alabama. All right. Bill Armistead. <laughs> Brett Doster. John Walls. Y'all give them a hand. But you know, there's Rich Hobson's here somewhere. I don't know where he got. <laughs> My good friend, Dean Young. Mr. Brant Frost and his daughters. Katie. And uh, somewhere I've missed the Ford family. That's half the, there they are right there. Give the Ford family. And I have my security man for 15 years. He's come back to visit me. This is Leonard Holyfield. There's one you don't see up here. Let me just tell you, he's done more for my campaign 
than anybody. And that's Almighty God. Amen. I want everybody to understand that when I talk when I talk about God in this campaign, I've never prayed to win this campaign. I've only prayed that God's will be done. Because I think you can you can sometimes win on your own and it's not a good thing. And sometimes you can lose and it's the best thing. But the best thing we can do is put it in the hands of the Almighty. And as Saran was saying, there, there's nothing too great for God. For one day every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain or hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. You know, we're put here on earth for a short time. And for that short time, our duty is to serve Almighty God. And to acknowledge Him in all things. I've just been talking. I've talked to the governor who's congratulated me, Governor Ivy. I've talked to Mr. Strange, who has recognized that I've won and that he would work with me. I've talked to Senator Lee, Senator Paul, Rand Paul, and Senator Cruz. and various others that are important in our government. Together we can make America great. We can support the president. Don't let anybody in the press think that because he supported my opponent that I do not support him and support his agenda. As long as it's constitutional, as long as it advances our society, our culture, our country, I will be supportive as long as it's constitutional. But we have to return the knowledge of God and the Constitution of the United States to the United States Congress. There's, I believe we can make America great, but we must make America good, and you cannot make America good without acknowledging the sovereign source of that goodness, the sovereign source of our law, liberty, and government, which is Almighty God. We have become a nation that has distanced ourselves from the very foundation. Washington said what, uh, that of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion, and morality are indispensable sports. We've got to recognize that we've been separated by something that separation of church and state doesn't stand for. It doesn't separate us from God. Nothing can separate us from God. We are one nation under God, and we can become one nation unified. There's so much division in our society. Protest. Demonstrations. Mobs. Racial strife. But we're all created in the image of God. I recall what Harry Truman said in his inaugural address. The American people stand firm in the faith which has inspired this nation from the beginning. We believe that all people are created in the image of God, and from that faith we will not be moved. We've been moved, but we can move back. God can still bring us back. You know, the Constitution has been my life. I was sworn many, many years ago to the United States Constitution on the banks of the Hudson River as a cadet at the United States Military Academy. I fought in a war to defend that Constitution. I fought in the courts against liberal judges that have usurped their authority on that Constitution. And I'll fight for you at the United States Senate. I'll fight for the people of this state and of this nation who want to bring our country back to its greatness. And we can, and we will. 
and thank you very much for your support. This is a this is a time for victory. It's a time to remember the struggles we've gone through, but it's also time to rededicate our lives to God and to the Constitution and to our country, to our families. Let's go again and make America great. Thank you. May God bless you in the state of Alabama. Thank you. But we've had these lies and lies and lies from Ronald Reagan, who was a liar and who lied on abortion. It was, of course, Ronald Reagan who nominated to the bench the homosexual judge that outlawed Proposition 8, contrary to the Democratic will of the voters in California to allow same-sex marriage. It was Ronald Reagan who appointed Sandra Day O'Connor, a pro-abortion judge, after he said he wouldn't. And following in the footsteps of Ronald Reagan, we have the liar, Governor Bruce Rauner, who flip-flopped, now signing into law, requiring the taxpayer to pay for the slaughter of the unborn when there's no clinical warrant. And of course, this takes place in the name of social justice. Uh, <laughs> in other words, why should black women not be able to get abortions when they can't pay for them? Shouldn't the taxpayer kill their babies? Well, it shows that it's conservatives and people with Judeo-Christian values who are standing up for blacks. It's the mainstream media who wants black children dead. It's the Democratic Party who wants black children dead. And of course, it's the Republican Party establishment who wants black children dead. It just shows that Christians should not be naive in voting for Republicans and thinking that these people are necessarily conservatives or that they will keep their word and they will not lie the way Ronald Reagan lied and the way that now Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner has lied. The blood of the unborn will be avenged by God, just as took place in the days of King Manasseh in the Old Testament with the Molech worship, sacrificing the babies, the demonic. The same will happen now. The judgment of God will come upon these things. Unless he repents the way King Manasseh did, I pray that the first one the judgment of God comes on are politicians like Governor Bruce Rauner. But let's move on now to the Middle East. In a further letdown, after not moving the embassy as promised to Jerusalem, Rex Tillerson, U.S. Secretary of State, has openly castigated American Ambassador Friedman to Israel over his comments saying that American policy has absolutely never required an abandonment or a ban on settlements in the West Bank. Uh, what the ambassador said is simply a historical fact. He simply stated a historical fact and it moved and it constituted no shift in American policy. He simply stated a fact by which the State Department establishment led by Mr. Tillerson came down upon him. Again, pray for Mr. Trump. His hands are tied. He has had to run against both the Democratic Party and against the Republican Party. Mr. Tillerson is no friend of Israel. By the way, this Secretary of State Tillerson, is he an idiot? I mean, uh, he says, we solved the Israeli-Palestinian peace dilemma. We start solving a lot of the peace throughout the Middle East region. Does he really believe this Obama position? This European position? Let's, let's play, shall we? Just for a minute while I divert for two seconds. So in other words, there wouldn't be an ISIS, there wouldn't be an Al-Qaeda, there wouldn't be a Hezbollah, there wouldn't be a Hamas, there wouldn't be an Islamic Jihad, there wouldn't be a Muslim Brotherhood. Things would be going swell in Egypt, which just overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood. They'd be going swell in Yemen, where the elected government was just overthrown, right? They'd be going swell in the Iran. Iran would stop with the nukes and stop with the ICBMs. The Russians would get out of Syria. What the hell is it? I mean... Is this Tillerson serious? Sounds like an idiot. Goes right from the oil company right into the, uh, in, into the midst of this stuff, and he makes no sense. Trump was putting a lot of pressure, Tillerson said, on them, the Israelis and Palestinians, that it was time to get to the table. Time to get to the table to do what? Give up your capital? Give up Judea and, 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 and Samaria? For what? 
today we traveled, we went up to Gaza. You know, I'm not just going to uh, department stores around here. I haven't been to one department store yet. I'm going into the real places. We went down to the Gaza Strip, right on the border. I took a very close look at that. To the extent I could, as a member of the public, looked at the Iron Dome uh, system. I mean, not the specifics, obviously, because that's all classified. Looked at uh, some of the, the pictures of the tunnels that Hamas is building and others. Unbelievable. You can drive jeeps through them. The Israelis are having to give them the cement and steel that they use to build the tunnels so 40 or 50 or 60 terrorists can come into these kibbutz or wherever to slaughter their own people. Do we do that? And now we have Tillerson, uh, another Secretary of State, who apparently has now been taken over by the, uh, by the uh, State Department bureaucrats and Obama holdovers. If we can just resolve the Israeli and the Palestinian matter. Well, you know, the Palestinians were given Gaza. Do you know what the Palestinian connection to Gaza is? Zero. Zero. Just like the Palestinian connection to Jerusalem prior to 70 or 80 years ago. Zero. Just like somehow the Palestinians were the indigenous peoples of Judea and Samaria. Notice it's called Judea. I mean, I'm just making the point. Have you noticed that? Do you know the Israelis supply the electricity to Gaza? And they keep trying to blow up the, pub, the, the, the electric utility, which is right on the border, feeding them their electricity? Because Hamas wants to demonstrate or claim to the European press and the American press too, the hostile press. See this? The Jews won't even give us electricity. The Jews supply the water. They send in 800 trucks a day filled with food and other necessities. But you know who's killing Palestinians in the Gaza? Hamas. It is a, it is a one-party you know, iron-fisted mob. That's what it, I just wanted to point that out because this Tillerson is making comments that that are just unbelievable. So, so basically, the way you resolve the Middle East is for the Jews to give up their capital and to give up more land to become more vulnerable to people who say not a single Jew can live in this land. The Israelis don't say not a single Palestinian can live in this land. 20% of the population, excuse me, 20% of the, of the land mass in Judea and Samaria, Samaria is controlled by the Palestinians, if effectively, in their neighborhoods and so forth. 1.5% by the Jews. It's still too much. Too much, they've got to get out. Anyway, enough. Let's end this with a very positive speech, a floor speech by a real senator, Ted Cruz, the 50th anniversary of Jerusalem the liberation of Jerusalem. Cut one, go. Since coming under its sovereignty, Israel, the one true democracy in the Middle East that shares our values of freedom, has protected people of all faiths in Jerusalem and ensured their access to holy sites so that they might worship freely. They have protected the rights of Jews, of Christians, and of Muslims. This has occurred even while religious minorities were being targeted and persecuted and attacked throughout the Middle East. And religious and historical sites are being demolished today by radical Islamic terrorists. Today is a day where we must also reassert historical truth. The historic connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem and the land of Israel did not begin in 1967. These profound ties to Jerusalem have existed for thousands of years. They can be traced back and have been reaffirmed through numerous archaeological excavations such as those in the city of David. In the past several years, I've traveled to Israel three times. There is something that stirs inside each time I'm there. It is remarkable to observe the great successes and achievements of this small and yet mighty country that is one of America's strongest allies in the world. It is long past time 
that America do something that it should have done two decades ago. Move the American embassy to Jerusalem and formally recognize Jerusalem as Israel's eternal and undivided capital. Every nation on earth, our embassy is in its capital city, except for Israel. There is no reason Israel should be treated any worse when they are such, an un, such a reliable and unshakable ally. We should honor the promise that Democratic presidents and Republican presidents have made for decades and move our embassy to Jerusalem. Not a single liberal Democrat in the United States Congress who is Jewish made a speech like that any time this week on the 50th anniversary of the liberation and the reunification of Jerusalem with its people, the people of Israel. You didn't hear a floor speech like this from Chuck Schumer or any other Jewish senator, any other Democrat, because they don't believe that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Jewish people, or they would have said so today, but they didn't. Just keep that in mind. Here we have a Gentile. Here we have Ted Cruz, who says more to support the state of Israel than anybody else that I'm aware of. And you know who else supports the state of Israel more than most? Evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for me this week in Israel. I'll be winging my way home, whatever that means, flying home soon, uh, early next week, and we'll be broadcasting live from the United States. God bless you all, and thank you very much. Dog Mattis is no friend of Israel, and we must understand that Mr. McMaster's is probably an enemy of Israel, if these are the people with whom Mr. Trump surrounds himself. It may be that Mr. Breitbart and others who have left this administration, and Dr. Gorka, are playing a lateral motion, uh, still working with Mr. Trump to outmaneuver the Republican Party establishment with whom Mr. Trump is forced to make deals in his own jargon and colloquialism of the art of the deal. Nonetheless, this is what has happened this week, another major disappointment in American policy concerning the Middle East and Israel. We also have this week the decision by 92% of the Kurds to vote for an independence. This may not happen quickly, it almost certainly will not. But Iraqi Kurdistan does not want to be part of Iraq, and this includes the oil-rich area of Kirkuk. The government, which is controlled largely by Western-backed Sunnis of Iraq, in, based in Baghdad, has now outlawed international flights going into or out of Kurdistan. You can only fly domestically in and out of Kurdistan. You cannot fly internationally out of Kurdistan. Additionally, other countries are being urged to close their consulates in Kurdistan and give it no sense of any international recognition. A Shia cleric, a leading Shia cleric, who is, is opposed to Kurdish independence, has preached a major sermon against it to unite Iraq's somewhat pro-Iranian and often strongly pro-Iranian Shia community concentrated in the south, mainly around the city of Basra, against Kurdish independence. We've said repeatedly that the Kurds, who are the descendants of the ancient Medes anthropologically, are the only people in Iraq who the West can even trust. Nonetheless, the United States caught up on the political quagmire is opposing Kurdish independence. Turkey has accused Israel of having a hand in the Kurdish elections. This is the government of Mr. Erdogan, who was a notorious human rights abuser and a member of NATO. But this week in prophecy, these events involving the descendants of the Medes have been what's taking place, and it is of prophetic significance. Turkey is threatening military action, and Turkey has also cut off the oil pipeline that goes through Turkey carrying Kurdish oil to uh, tanker ports. Because it is inland, 
it has no access to any seaway or any port facility where the oil can be transferred onto tankers for export. This is the problem economically of Kurdish independence. While we can sympathize with the national ambitions of the Kurds, there is an economic obstacle that is determined by nothing other than the realities of geography. But watch this situation. You've got Turkey threatening military action against an, a Kurdish state, already taking economic action. The central government of Iraq taking economic and political action against Kurdish independence and international pressure coming against the Kurds. Uh, this is a most unfortunate situation. There is nobody else in Iraq who I wouldn't turn my back on. I would not. I would turn my back on the Kurds, but I would never turn my back on the Sunni Muslims or the Shia Muslim populations of that country. Let's continue this week in prophecy. Back to the United States. Lucian Graves, the leader of the Satanic Temple in Salem, Massachusetts, has embarked on a policy where his organization and the Satanic Temple, which is its flagship, are urging Satanists across the country to demand that Christian shop owners bake cakes honoring Satan and bake cakes for same-sex marriages against their consciences and religious values. It is simply an orchestrated attempt to use legal means to persecute Christians by open avowed Satanists. The Satanic Temple, it's based in Salem, Mass., is encouraging its followers to find Christian bakers and ask them to bake cakes honoring the Prince of Darkness as a show of support for gay couples who've been denied cakes for weddings. Lucian Graves is the co-founder of the Satanic Temple in Massachusetts, and he joins us tonight. Lucian Graves, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, thank you. I'm of mixed views on this. I mean, part of me wants to take it seriously because there are real legal questions here, but then part of me wants to tell the truth, which is you're just a troll. And working out well, your unhappy I, you, childhood. You're going on the to have to define us. for me what you what you think a credible religion is at this point, and then maybe you should thank organizations like Liberty Council or the Alliance Defending Freedom when they put forward legal cases claiming that they're taking a religious point of view, and the Supreme Court just taking those at face value. The fact of the matter is, we do have affirmative values. These are an expression of our deeply held beliefs. And I think that's all anybody really needs. Yeah, is I mean, we've had this conversation lobby, really, before. Truly, and you, just, right, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, right. in the end, this is about getting publicity and hassling people. If you really have sincere beliefs and you're publicity worshiping. Publicity to what end? It's publicity towards, on, towards I, issues I, I, we, I, we truly I mean, I do. Honestly, I honestly think, not to play shrink, but it has to do with what was clearly an unhappy childhood uh, that you had. But I guess my, my question is. If you have these sincere beliefs, if this is a real religion, then why not practice it? Why waste all this time bothering other people who are minding their own business? Are, are you saying why don't we practice it in private and in our own churches and in our own homes? Because then I would say I'm, I'm completely on board with you, and, and that's exactly pretty much the message we're putting out. You don't see us going into public forums where there isn't already religious representation. What we're doing is we're upholding pluralism. And even in the case with the case, no, you're not upholding uh, pluralism. You're going and you're seeking out people to bother, and you're you're we're not seeking out small people to yes, bother. You are. We're not. We're not. You're, we're yeah, not yeah, the well, ones. Maybe I'm misreading up, this. No, maybe I'm misreading this story. We're not the ones opening up the forum. Do you ever have an evangelical on and ask them why they need to force their Bibles into schools? Why they need to put up a cross on public property? when they have churches all over the place. I yeah. mean, when you open up that public what, forum, you what have they're to not be prepared doing, for What they're not doing viewpoints. is show, hold on, Sonia. They're not, what they're not doing is showing up at your house and saying, you know, say the Lord's Prayer with me, Lucian Graves, and if you don't, then I'm gonna sue you, or I'm gonna get the government to launch a suit against you. You're seeking, you're, you say you and your followers, to the extent you have any, are seeking out small businesses that don't want to accommodate you in order to force them to violate their own beliefs. That's my understanding. Well, it highlights a, it, well, it highlights a disparity. The fact is that religion is a protected class, sexual orientation is not. If you want to be able to deny people service, fine, let's be consistent. The, the gay hairdresser shouldn't have to dress the hair of the evangelical theocrat who wouldn't serve him a cake. 
then we're on an equal level. Then well, that's actually, okay. I kind of that I'm fine with that. I mean, I I think if it's your business and and you're being asked to violate your beliefs. I think, and they're sincere this beliefs. This does bring up I some think, troubling questions, though, about protected classes and, you know, and it, race. It does bring up, it does actually, yes it, yes, it does. But one of the reasons that this was not an issue after the civil rights movement, I mean, I don't, no one's defending, denying people service on the base of their race, which is clearly immoral and wrong and illegal, and it should be. But questions like the bakery out in Colorado, one of the reasons those haven't arisen in the last 50 years is because people had a sense of decency and politeness, and they didn't feel that it was the right thing to get in someone else's face and force them for the sake of making some kind of public statement to violate their beliefs. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, they didn't behave like sure, you. Sure, then we should... Then, then the gay baker shouldn't be forced to make a make a cake for the evangelical theocrat. And then I'm well, fine but I, with that. I kind I of agree. One, I actually kind of agree with that. Two but here's, no, but here's the difference. I haven't seen a single case of an evangelical forcing any kind of bakery to bake a cake that violates the baker's personal beliefs. And if there was such a case, I would come down on the side of the bakery because why don't you back off and let people live their lives? In fact, why don't you do that? Lucian Graves, right, exactly. if indeed that's but your you real can't name. Because religion is a protected class. So yeah, whatever. They either you're, take you're, away you're making the a nonsensical class point, and I think you or... should crawl back into your hole. Thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, this comes on the back of Satanists now putting satanic symbolism next to mangers in public squares in the state of Florida. How much worse can it get? Well, the Lord Jesus is coming, and he told us to expect these things. But again, you can see how the stage is being set for Antichrist this week in prophecy. Incredibly, this week in prophecy, son of Hamas, as he's called, Mossab Hassan Yosef, the son of the primary founder of Hamas, spoke at the UN and exposed the lies of the Palestinian Authority. It is quite a video clip to watch. Astounded and shocked is the only description you can give for the facial expressions of the Palestinian, so-called Palestinian delegation and other Islamic countries in the United Nations as he spoke, telling the simple truth that the Palestinian Authority is self-appointed, corrupt, and unelected. Israel, the occupying power, continues with its colonial policy and its daily violations. It continues to abuse, to arbitrarily detain, to carry out ethnic cleansing, steal land and natural resources, uproot trees, steal money, Israeli activity to Judaize Jerusalem, demolition of homes, confiscation of land and property, spoiling of natural resources. Racist violations, by Israel. Israel continues to commit various forms of human rights violations in Palestine. Israel, the occupying power, is advancing in its efforts of mass colonization and continued apartheid, put an end to this colonialist regime. Apartheid, atrocities and massive destruction inflicted on the Palestinian people. War crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing and state terror. Thank you, United Nations Watch. Shukran Sayyid Rais. I take the floor on behalf of the UN Watch. My name is Mus'ab Hassan Youssef. I grew up in Ramallah as a member of Hamas. I address the words to the Palestinian Authority, which claims to be the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. I ask, where does your leg legitimacy come from? The Palestinian people did not elect you, and they did not appoint you to represent them. You are self-appointed. Your accountability is not to your own people, this is evidenced by your own total violation for their human rights. In fact, the Palestinian individual and their human development is the least of your concerns. You kidnap Palestinian students from campus and torture them in your jails. You torture your political rivals. The suffering of the Palestinian people is the outcome of your selfish political interest. You are the greatest enemy of the Palestinian people. If Israel did not exist, you would have no one to, to blame. Take responsibility for the outcome of your own actions. You fan the flames of conflict to maintain your abusive power. Finally, you use this platform 
to mislead the international community, to mislead the Palestinian society, to believe that Israel is responsible for the problems you create. Thank you. Nonetheless, it was quite a week. I only hope what he did registers. It certainly sent shockwaves this week in prophecies. The truth will still be heard, no matter who likes it and who doesn't, as long as God allows that truth to be heard. <coughs> Let's continue. In an area of Israel where there is good cooperation between the West Bank Arabs and the adjacent Israeli population, an area known as Har Adar, to the west of Jerusalem, a lot of West Bank Arabs find employment and they hire by crossing the border into Israel. The inter-community relations have been good. They've been to the economic benefit of both communities and the Israelis have been very lax in allowing people come to come to work daily inside Israel from the West Bank. Again, the Palestinian Authority will not tell you, and neither will anyone else, how the standard of living, including the employment situation, has improved dramatically under the Israelis for West Bank Arabs, compared to what it was prior to 1967. <coughs> it's improved dramatically, as has infant mortality improved, as has, which is of course lessened, as has longevity, which is, in, of course, increased. The socioeconomic, public health, and educational benefits to the Palestinian Arabs of the West Bank have only gotten better under the Israelis. And no place has this relationship been more amicable between Jew and Arab than at Har Adar until this past week. Taking advantage of the liberal border crossing policies or the liberal security barrier crossings, maintained by the Israelis, a Islamic terrorist crossed over and killed three Israeli border policemen. Uh, this has forced the Israelis to crack down and to put into place more stringent security for Arabs just simply trying to come to work and get a job. Again, they hurt their own people and they don't even care. This week in prophecy, the international police, Interpol, has accepted, quote unquote, Palestine as a member nation. And they do so despite the fact that the Palestinian Authority is engaged in support for terror. They've named 31 schools after suicide bombers. They've named three schools after Nazis and Nazi collaborators. They've named multiple other schools for imprisoned terrorists. But suicide bombers, they named schools after them. None of this matters to the international police or to the United Nations. It doesn't seemingly matter to the American State Department either, who continue to take the money of American taxpayers to fund the Palestinian Authority. Left-wing Jews have been active with the other opponents of Israel and Zionism in Great Britain and the Labour Party. Jews supporting Israel have been targeted by peripheral meetings at the Labour Party conference. Uh, these are sometimes called fringe conferences. In these conferences, Jews who are not anti-Israel, Jews who do not support BDS, Jews who give any indication of being supportive of Israel, are being told that there is no place for them in the Labour Party, and the Labour Party is being called upon to throw them out. Now, thus far, this has not been the policy of the mainstream leadership of the Labour Party, although it is no friend of Israel, to say the least. But the very fact that it is happening shows there's no place for Jews in the Labour Party. This is very much the equivalent of the Democratic Party in the United States, where we have the co-chairman of the Democratic Party, Congressman Ellis, who is a known anti-Semite and an outspoken anti-Semite. Uh, he's a Muslim. He is a proponent of... 
Now, since Congressman Keith Ellison's epic meltdown right here on Hannity two nights ago, we decided to take a closer look at the man who called me immoral and a liar. Now, it didn't take long to prove his hypocrisy, as his past reveals a host of radical connections, primarily to Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Now, Ellison has publicly admitted to what he calls an 18-month involvement with the group and its 1995 Million Man March. Now, according to the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Ellison's link to Farrakhan, well, it goes back much further. It dates back to his time as a law student at the University of Minnesota in the late 80s and early 90s. Now, my math not, may not be great, but early 90s to 1995 is not exactly 18 months. aide Khalid Abdul Muhammad, who famously, among other things, called Jews bloodsuckers of the black nation. And Ellison also wrote two articles as a law student in support of Louis Farrakhan. Now, in the first one, he defended the minister against accusations of racism, writing, quote, racism means conspiracy to subjugate and actual subjugation, and that means planned social, economic, and political subjugation of whites. It cannot be intelligently argued that the nation of Islam is doing this. And a fellow classmate told Minnesota Public Radio that my recollections of Keith are of that person who was very much in support of the nation of Islam and their messages that they tried to convey to the larger community. Now, in 2006, when his past caught up with him, Ellison denounced the nation of Islam. But the reality is this congressman not only associated with these radicals, but he spent years spewing their hateful rhetoric. And not surprisingly, when we reached out to Congressman Ellison, he finally responded late tonight with another attack on yours truly and failed to respond to the question at hand. His statement read, quote, Tomorrow, a set of devastating cuts will hit every American, costing 750,000 jobs over the course of the year if Congress does not act. The seriousness of these cuts was the subject and context of my spirited exchange with Sean Hannity on Tuesday night. Americans deserve journalists who provide responsible, objective reporting. Instead, Sean Hannity is bringing up my religion and making personal attacks. This this is sad. Can we get back to what's best for the American people now? Now, just like the other night, Congressman Ellison, he refused to answer our question. I wasn't questioning his religion. I was asking about his past association with Louis Farrakhan, Khalid Muhammad, and the Nation of Islam. Here with reaction from the New York Civil Rights Coalition, Michael Myers, and Fox News contributor, Deneen Borelli. I didn't ask about his religion. He didn't, not one bit. Didn't we, ask one question about it. We heard it. Listen, he's a left-wing radical. He had no intentions on debating you on the issues of the day that people are concerned about, which was the sequestration, the debt, and our deficit. But of course, he's going to attack you because that's what the left does. This is like the Chicago-style machine that wants to silence anyone that they oppose. They don't want to hear the other side of the argument. Well, you know, but, but, but this is deep because we, we all agree Farrakhan is a racist and an anti-Semite. Anyone disagree? No. You agree? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Now, here he's hanging out with also with Khalid Muhammad. Now, not only did he call Jews bloodsuckers of the black nation, he also said, kill everything white that's in sight, kill the women, kill the children, kill the old people, kill the babies. He used a slur for gay people. Kill them all. Sean, what we have to realize is that this nation and the so-called black nation um, for, for some time now have been enduring insufferable, wacky, unhinged leadership. And the, the likes of Keith Ellison, Louis Farrakhan, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, it goes on and on and on. Now, the point here is that the nation has become racialized and radicalized in terms of the leadership tier. And Keith Ellison, I watched the interview that you tried to have with him. He wasn't, he wasn't concerned about answering any of your questions. Oh, no. He came on this, this station to do two things. One, to defend the black messiah, who Jamie Foxx calls our Lord and Savior. Barack Obama, and to make and to make brownie points with the so what Deneen calls the left, what they call themselves progressives, meaning that they have declared war on the Republican Party, and they've declared war on Fox News Channel, which they see as right. an auxiliary but of the Republican is, Party. This is this is really serious, in as much as Farrakhan, one of the most divisive figures in our culture, rabid anti-Semite racist. Khalid Muhammad, kill the women, everything white that's in sight, kill the women, Wait kill the babies, don't, Hang on. Wait kill the don't, children. Don't forget, don't kill forget the, the, the Congressional well. Black Caucus, the entire Congressional Black Caucus, led then by 
Kweezy and Fume, they entered a sacred covenant with Minister Louis Farrakhan. All right, so the point is, as what, did the what, NA to be. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me a little bit. How has he gone this far without the scrutiny that we are now rightly giving? How has giving? he gotten this far? That, How has he gotten this far? That's very concerning. And even though he wrote this letter. Obama or Keith? I'm talking ago, about Keith. <laughs> I mean, it still doesn't erase what we know about this guy. You know what? I, I think it's very telling how we are able to put people in these positions where, in fact, it's very, uh, it's not good for our country. And considering the fact how he came out against you the other day, I mean, that, that just tells me where he really stands. And again, he did not want to debate you whatsoever. No, and listen, I gave him an opportunity to rant. No, you did. I wanted to ask times. him a question about the morality of the debt and the deficit. Right. Um, what is the difference? I mean, it, it, do we have somebody then in Congress that is the equivalent of, on one side of what the Klan is? Because I view the rabid rantings of Khalid Muhammad mm -hmm. as frightening in terms of racism anti-Semitism. It's not just that hook nose, yeah. bagel eating, so-called Jews. These are all comments that have come yeah, out but, of him. But Farrakhan's newspaper mm -hmm. once said that the God that teaches me, his newspaper I didn't, teaches me that the white man is the skunk of the planet Earth. Yeah. Well, look, Khalid Abdul Muhammad is dead. He's dead. And he's dead. I, but I debated him once Louis, for three hours. Louis Farrakhan still lives. And we have to understand that Louis Farrakhan has been for a long time the apostle of black racism and anti-Semitism. He's been embraced by, endorsed by, hugged by, given awards by, and the, by the black leadership, the tier, the black leadership tier. And they see him as the only black man in America, before Barack Obama, the only black man in America who could bring a million men, black men, to Washington, D.C. Now, I was the only one, I wasn't a national leader, but I was the only black so-called intellectual leader who opposed Louis Farrakhan's Million Man March because I thought it was racist, I thought it was sexist and regressive. Not one black leader, not Jesse Jackson, not Al Sharpton, who also called Jews, by the way, diamond merchants, um, not one black leader has opposed has opposed Louis Farrakhan. Well, you know, considering yeah. the importance of, especially the black community, having positive role models and positive leadership, we are not really seeing that today, especially on a national level. You look at the high unemployment, unemployment of, of the teens, the black teens are 40, 50 percent. Yep. You know, what are our politicians doing trying to fix the situation? They're not. They're politicians because they're in it for themselves. They're not doing anything for the black community. But it's also, Jobs, beca it's also because the black community it's also because the black community has been radicalized and racialized, and they send the same people back to office simply because All of the their time. skin they're color. They're not doing anything. And they're not doing anything right. to, 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 to about unemployment, unemployment, about education, time, anything. And even to take it to a sadder level, you two will be attacked for calling out people that are racist I find and bigoted. I find these people hurt. insufferable. But I'll take the attack. All right. <laughs> Thank you both for being with us. All matter of vehement anti-Zionist policies and organizations, but has himself made statements in league with those who could only be seen as anti-Semitic. There's no place for Jews in the American Democrat Party, but people continue to live in a bubble and under a delusion. It has been 50 years this week in prophecy since the first Jewish settlements in their biblical homeland of the West Bank began. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has pledged that there will be no more forcible uprooting of Jewish settlements from the West Bank. These territories are, of course, not occupied. The Jews are the indigenous people, as is confirmed by the archaeological, historical, and biblical record, despite the repeated lie that it's an occupying presence. That has been this week in prophecy, 50 years since the first settlements. Let's continue. In Canada, the Liberal Member of Parliament, Ikra Khalid, uh, Khalid uh, who was the arch proponent in the Canadian Parliament of the M103 legislation that legally condemns Islamophobia, has again reiterated her opposition to any outspoken criticism of Islam, even radical Islam. But the M103 only protects Muslims. It does not protect Christians. It does not protect Jews. It does not protect people of any other faith. 
In other words, it's still legal to say what you want against Christians, against Israel, against Jews, against whoever. Just don't say anything against Muslims. And the Canadian left and the party of Justin Trudeau, of course, are proponents of it. And so we go. The unholy alliance continues in the Middle East between Russia and Iran against American interests. And increasingly, those interests include the Kurdish YPG. Supporting this is, of course, Turkey. So now you have Russia and Iran in collusion being aided by Turkey and a political policy that is vehemently anti-American and vehemently anti-Israel. Once again, this begins to acutely resemble more and more Ezekiel 38 and 39. Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Mr. Trump has made concessions more than I would have liked. I personally would like to see the United States and covertly Israel begin attacking Iranian targets in Iraq as soon as ISIS has been finally obliterated, which it nearly is. America needs to turn its B-52s and its B-1 bombers against Iranian targets and make it clear that the United States supports the right of the Kurdish people to self-determination. But we have a triangle taking shape of Russia, courtesy of Mr. Putin, Iran, and Turkey attacking pro-American targets who oppose the Assad regime. The Assad regime, of course, being the Shia bedfellow due to Alawite Islam with terrorist Iran. We would also continue to ask people to pray that Mr. Trump would not acquiesce, but abandon Barack Obama's betrayal of America, of Israel, and of moderate so-called Arab Gulf states when the Iranian treaty, completely illegal and never, never ratified by the Senate, comes up for renewal and reconsideration. Mr. Trump knows it's bad. He said to the United Nations, it's bad and it's wrong. He said it's embarrassing. Let us hope that he shows the courage of his convictions. So far, he's been long on rhetoric, but short on action. The same is unfortunately seeming to take place in North Korea. The present state of diplomatic relations and international efforts to address the crisis in North Korea shows Mr. Tillerson beginning to push the United States towards another Iranian pseudo-treaty, this time with North Korea. Anytime the United States has entered into negotiations with North Korea, made concessions, even given them aid. It has done nothing to stop them, but only aided and abetted them in their continued efforts to acquire the capacity to attack the United States. Let us hope that Mr. Trump will not be as corrupt and as stupid as Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, George Bush, and a host of presidents, raging back to Harry Truman. Turkey can now be calculated to have imprisoned more journalists than communist China. The human rights abuses and political crackdown of the Erdogan government continues again unabetted. Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Uh, my guest was the editor-in-chief of uh, the newspaper Chuhum Ruyet in uh, Turkey. He now lives in exile in Germany and has become a symbol of the struggle of the press under the rule of Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey. The Turkish president himself filed a criminal campaign against Mr. Dündar back in 2015 after his newspaper published explosive reports alleging that Turkey's intelligence services were secretly sending weapons to Islamist rebels in Syria. Charged with espionage, Mr. Dündar was detained for several months. He escaped unharmed from an arm assault in front of the trial court. And after being released from pretrial custody, he decided to leave Turkey and received a six-year sentence in abstentia. Thank you very much for joining us. 
I thank you. Mr. Dündar, obviously uh, your uh, exile in uh, Germany uh, caused uh, and is still causing a lot of trouble uh, between uh, Turkey and uh, Germany. Is it because uh, you're a well-known person or is it because those reports I mentioned put the finger on the very, very sensitive issue in Turkey, especially for President Erdogan? Yeah, I guess the second option is much more true uh, because, I mean, my story was about an illegal uh, operation of the Turkish intelligence service. It was an international crime, so it was not me, but the government who must be, you know, judged and uh, must be sentenced maybe. And that's why they are trying to hide uh, their... Uh, crime and just pointing out me and accusing me for being a spy or a terrorist. But uh, of course, I mean, the rest of the world very know, know the situation and that's why this is, this, uh, is a problem between two countries. Right. Uh, I mean, there have been uh, pressure, uh, obviously, on the German authorities uh, not to allow you in, but you, you feel that uh, Germany is on your side in this fight? Not only Germany, but many countries and many uh, uh, journalist associations and NGOs in the world defending human rights and press freedom and freedom of expression. And that's the way it should be, because I'm a journalist and I'm doing my job. And the story is true. Nobody denied that from the government side. So it shouldn't be a problem in the you know, civilized world. But if you are doing a cr crime by the government, then of course you must be hiding it. And that's why they are in panic. Why did you decide uh, to leave? I mentioned uh, this uh, incident. Uh, we probably remember those images of a gunman uh, maybe trying uh, to take your life uh, during one of uh, the trials. I mean, was this really the trigger that pushed you to say, I'm not going to wait because my life is in danger in my country? Yeah, of course. Imagine a president who pointed out a journalist and threatened him by myself and saying that this journalist will pay a heavy price. And he said it in a TV show. And afterwards, I was, you know, uh, shot at in front of the courthouse, which is the most secure place. It should be the most secure place in the country. So not only this life uh, danger, but at the same time, there's no rule of law anymore. How can we, you know, uh, expect uh, justice from a courthouse who is controlled by the government now? And that's why I, stay, I decided to stay uh, for a while outside Turkey. Right. Uh, do you, I mean, are you saying that this attempt, you think, was something that was coordinated by the president, by the government? Or was it just that they created such an atmosphere where people would feel uh, the way this person felt and took a gun and tried to take your life? I guess the gunman was inspired, at least, by, by the president himself. And if you show someone, a journalist, as a target to, to the people, that can be the result of it. So he should have known that. And that's why not only me, all the journalists in Turkey who are searching for truth are in danger now. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a, a context uh, that has uh, dramatically changed after uh, the failed coup uh, back in July. I think uh, over 120 journalists have been arrested, which puts Turkey basically at the top of the list jailing, of countries jailing uh, journalists. How bad is the situation? I know some of uh, the editors and journalists at uh, Joe Muriet are uh, still in legal trouble, but they're not the only one. Unfortunately not. Uh, well, I've been a journalist uh, for 37 years now, and this is the worst period of time in my life and in Turkey's history, I guess. Uh, we've never seen such a crackdown before, even in during the, uh, the military uh, coup times in 80s or so. And imagine that our paper's editor-in-chief, four writers, three lawyers, 
even the team maker is, was in jail. So 11 of them in jail now, together with 100, now 50, I guess, journalists. Uh, so, and thousands of other cases uh, against journalists in Turkey, mainly because of their critical positions. So this is really the worst case in our history. And Turkey is the biggest jail in, in, for journalists in the world. So really, it's the, this is the worst period of time in our history. Are you disappointed uh, by the reaction of uh, Western powers, uh, especially Europe vis-a-vis -vis Turkey on this issue? We know there are other issues between Europe and Turkey, the situation in, in Syria, the refugee issue. Are you disappointed that Europe is maybe not as vocal as you would like Europe to be on this issue? Well, I am totally and deeply disappointed by the attitude of Europe because of the de refugee deal. I mean, the deal was uh, Turkey promised to keep the refugees in Turkish soil, not sending them to Europe. And in return, I'm afraid um, Turkey bought their silence and got some money. And uh, really, we've been struggling for uh, Western ideals like freedom of press, freedom of expression, democracy, secularism, equality of men and women, and against an oppressive government. And uh, in Europe in general, France, for example, why they are so silent about this and how they can, you know, keep the silence against this oppression. oppression. So really uh, disappointing. and. Turkey, Turkish government, and especially Erdogan is giving the example of France while supporting the state of emergency, showing that France is, has the same rule at the moment. And I don't know how many journalists you have in France jails. So someone should explain him that this is something to totally different. Uh, but really, uh, unfortunately, um, they keep their silence and uh, I want them to be more vocal about those human rights issues in Turkey. Would you say uh, Turkey is now a dictatorship? Uh, there is a forthcoming uh, referendum to change the system and make it a truly presidential system uh, that is scheduled for April 16th. Uh, but I would say regardless of uh, the results from uh, this referendum, do you already consider uh, that Recep Tayyip Erdogan is a dictator today? Well, he will be, if he wins this uh, referendum, he will be controlling the whole state machinery together with the judiciary. So uh, Turkey will decide between a democracy and dictatorship on the 15th of, 16th of April. So it is crucial, most important election, maybe the last election of Turkey's history. So uh, that's why we are just struggling for it. And uh, it's 50-50 yes and no, according to the opinion polls now. And it is very crucial moment in Turkey's history. So from then on, it will be very difficult to stop him anymore. Right. Uh, what do you make of the accusations that uh, the crackdown, well, uh, the justification, I should say, that the crackdown is because of this coup attempt and the fact that uh, people who are uh, faithful to uh, the exiled cleric Fethullah Gulen have infiltrated all uh, the state apparatus and even institutions, including uh, the media. Is there some truth to this? Or are you saying this is just a pretext for an authoritarian crackdown? Well, this Gulen movement was in place and, uh, to the state machinery by Erdogan, and they were hand in hand governing th this country. And if there's, there was a crime, they were, you know, partners. And then they separated, and Erdogan starts, you know, blaming them. And uh, we've been, you know, warning the government about the danger of this movement, and, but they didn't care at that time. And now, ironically, they, you know, the government is against them and uh, accusing us for being Gulenists. It's really strange and ironic. But I guess the, the, 
the, the military intervention attempt was something serious, and thanks God we survived from that. But Erdogan has been using it as an excuse to enhance his power. And, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were under custody at the moment, and he controlled the press and state of emergency, using state of emergency as a martial law. And that's why, I mean, it, he said it's, it was a gift of God for him, this, this military intervention attempt, and he's been using it uh, for his power. Yet Turkey remains a member of NATO, violating the very principles NATO was established to defend. There are those who are saying that Ankara, the Turkish capital, the Turkish government, should be denied veto power within the NATO alliance. We quite agree it should be. The question is, how long can human rights abuses and civil rights abuses and violations of the NATO treaty be continued to allow to continue in order to placate the regime in Turkey that is tipping ever more towards Islamic fundamentalism and Sharia? Moving to Rome and the Vatican, 62 Roman Catholic scholars, then supplemented by a further 22, have issued a statement. This statement, a sort of amicus curiae document, a friend of the court document, essentially says that Pope Francis has engaged in the promotion of heresy. While Roman Catholics are obligated to follow the leaders of the sitting Pope, every once in a very long while an individual strays so far from biblical and dogmatic teachings while serving as Pope that members of the Catholic Church may feel compelled to take action against them. Many believe that radical leftist Pope Francis of Argentina merits this sort of attention. In a bold move, 62 clergy and lay scholars from around the world sent a letter to Francis on August 11 with the purpose of making a filial correction for the Pope propagating heresy. This move has not been made against any Pope since the Middle Ages. Wrote the letter's writers, with profound grief, but moved by fidelity to our Lord Jesus Christ, by love for the Church and for the Papacy, and by filial devotion toward yourself, we are compelled to address a correction to Your Holiness on account of the propagation of heresies affected by the apostolic exhortation and res Laetitia, and by other words, deeds and omissions of Your Holiness. It went on, as subjects, we do not have the right to issue to Your Holiness that form of correction by which a superior coerces those subject to him with the threat or administration of punishment. We issue this correction, rather, to protect our fellow Catholics and those outside the Church from whom the key of knowledge must not be taken away, hoping to prevent the further spread of doctrines which tend of themselves to the profaning of all the sacraments and the subversion of the law of God. They added, we adhere wholeheartedly to the doctrine of papal infallibility. Neither Emrys Laetitia nor any of the statements which have served to propagate the heresies which this exhortation insinuates are protected by that divine guarantee of truth. Do you think the signers were right to make this move against Pope Francis? It doesn't actually call him a heretic, it just says he promotes heresy concerning his lax position on sacramental access to divorced and remarried Catholics, and there are other issues as well concerning homosexuality, where he's also morally compromised and failed to give a scriptural or scripturally based and morally coherent leadership and voice to Roman Catholic policy. It has become a quagmire. Conservative Catholics do not know what the Vatican actually believes or will do or will uphold anymore. Yet 62 leading Roman Catholic theologians have issued a public statement. That is the first time that this has happened since, since the Middle Ages. It goes to demonstrate that Roman Catholicism is not about theology or about ecclesiology in the sense of the New Testament. It is rather about theocratic politics. It is rather about corrupt banking. It is rather about all of these things taking place under the banner of an insatiable religious hypocrisy propagated by the papacy. 
Catholic people cannot ignore this anymore. Even their own theologians are standing up and saying there's something wrong with this Pope. Not that his predecessors were much better, or any better. His pedophile protecting predecessors were as bad as he is. Yet now it has gotten to the point where it's impossible to reconcile traditional Roman Catholic dogma with what this Pope is doing and saying. And Catholics know it. And their scholars, their theologians are saying it. Once more, our response is simply to point to the words of Jesus in Revelation 18.4. Come out of her, my people, lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. And that would apply to Eastern Orthodoxy. It would apply to the cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism. And by no means least of all, it would apply to liberal Protestantism and the World Council of Churches. But first and foremostly, it applies to the Vatican and the Papacy, the Apostate Church in Rome. Let us continue. This Week in Prophecy, Atawa, Egypt, a small village, Coptic Christians, including children, were again attacked. Christian businesses burned and ransacked. Again, this taking place even in the more moderate and the more stable Islamic countries. You will not find Christian communities being attacked by Jews in Israel. That doesn't happen. The Israeli authorities wouldn't allow it. A recent arson attack on a church in Galilee caused the prime minister to say, this is an attack on the whole nation and is under active criminal investigation. Yet the world gangs up on Israel, while Christians are being horrifically persecuted throughout the Arab world. The UN Human Rights Commission, of which Saudi Arabia, that will hang people for becoming Christians as a member, has finally agreed to investigate the human rights abuses perpetrated against Christians in the Middle East. With the Saudi Arabian Wahhab on the UN Human Rights Commission, going to investigate the persecution of Christians when they are the persecutors is absurd and ridiculous. Why does the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and other civilized countries, supposedly civilized, continue to fund the UN unless these reforms are carried out and nations like Saudi Arabia are removed from things like human rights commissions? A homosexual academic who is a member of a charity that protects and advances the interests of transgender people has found himself in trouble at Bath Spa University when he's attempted to do postgraduate research. His postgraduate research, however, was into the area of transgender people wanting reverse gender reassignment surgery. There is a phenomenon where people claiming to suffer from dysphoria, gender dysphoria, wanting so-called sex change operations, after having those operations, change their mind and want to be reassigned to the gender where they were born. When this homosexual himself, a proponent of transgenderism, wanted to research this phenomenon, it was challenged on ethical grounds. Now, if someone was to challenge sexual reassignment surgery, they would be automatically called homophobes and transphobic. But when someone co-equally wants to address those who are transsexual, wanting to revert back to what they are chromosomally and genetically, that is, the gender of their birth, the gender of their genes. This is being called unethical. This hypocrisy knows no end. And again, it shows they will target even other homosexuals. Caitlin, Caitlin Jenner honored with the Arthur Ashe Courage Award at the ESPYs. Did she deserve it? Was it the right choice? Here she was last night on ABC. Take a look. All across the world, at this very moment, there are young people coming to terms with being transgender. 
They're learning that they're different. And they're trying to figure out how to handle that on top of every other problem that a teenager has. They're getting bullied. They're getting beaten up. They're getting murdered. And they're committing suicide. But this transition has been harder on me than anything I could imagine. And that's the case for so many others besides me. For that reason alone, trans people deserve something vital. They deserve your respect. I'd like to thank, personally, my buddy Diane So, You know, you can only tell your story the first time once, and Diane, you did it so authentically and so gracefully. Joining me now in the audience, Shagun Odu Olowu, entertainment journalist, Zoe Tur, pilot and reporter who herself is transgender, and Ben Shapiro, senior editor, Breitbart News, author of Bullies. Ben, does she deserve this award? For what? For, for courageously coming forward, for having been an athlete of great prowess, and now fighting a new battle. Uh, what exactly is the battle? I mean, self-definition is what you do, and my baby's doing it 18 months old. I wasn't aware that you get a medal for it. Shagun? I think she's a fraud. I thought the message and the messenger were, were wrong. I was in the audience at the ESPYs, and if you want to talk about courage, she said it herself in her speech that she retreated to her mansion on, on, in the hill and was... Where was she in the 70s when, gay, when the LGBT community was fighting for acceptance? Where was she in the 80s when the AIDS epidemic was ravaging the she LGBT community? She was hiding, community? feeling bad about hiding. being transgender. Where was she in the 90s when shows like 90210, no, Melrose I, Place, and Will and Grace were bringing people, gay people to the forefront? Where was she in 2000s she when couldn't come forward yet. My thing is this. She's a 65-year-old she's a rich white woman that decided to do this, but don't tell me you're walking in the truth for other transgender kids, kids of color who don't have that war chest of money to get the surgery to look like she looks. They're not going to get the cover okay. of Vanity Fair. So don't tell me that she is going to stand on the banks waving her hand as the Re beacon for transgender when there's a river of blood of people that die. Okay, regardless of who the messenger is, okay, whether you like it or her not or think that this is an authentic person or not or her, her intent, she is bringing a conversation to the forefront that is helping people better understand, not you, unfortunately, better understand the transgender community, have more empathy, have more tolerance, and that is saving lives. Because as she stated, there are so many transgender youths and adults that are victims of violence, that are beat up, that are bullied because of the discrimination. So thank God that now she is mainstreaming it so people can better understand it and have tolerance. Sam, that so, so, wait. Sam, Sam, that's dead wrong. Wait, no, wait, it's wait, not wait, dead wait, wrong. She lives, in the, she lives in the most accepting city in the, in, in, oh my in, in the state. And go do that in Alabama. Don't know what you're I, I, be a hero. Be <laughs> yeah. a hero. No. Listen, to, listen to Zoe. Let's listen to, to Zoe. Okay, uh, Zoe, go ahead. Good try. <laughs> you have to bifurcate it. Did she deserve the honor? Probably not. Is she brave? Of course she's brave. All those years invested as, as this sports legend to come out transgender is horribly difficult. It is the most difficult thing you can do. I've been overseas. I've flown uh, helicopter missions, surveillance missions. I've been shot, stabbed. Being brave is being yourself. And being transgender is it's about the bravest thing you can do. Did with she deserve the award? Yes. Why are we mainstreaming delusion? Uh, it's not delusion. Why, why would delusion. you call it delusion? Because Bruce Caitlyn Jenner, I'll call him Caitlyn Jenner. No, because it's that's her. Gonna... You're not being polite to the pronoun. Because it's disrespectful. It, okay, forget about the disrespect. Facts don't care about your feelings. It turns out that every chromosome, every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body is male with the exception of some of his sperm cells. You it turns out that his brain structure is male. Wait, I need it to... turns out that he still has all of his male appendages. But, but, How he feels on the inside is irrelevant but, to the question of his biological status. I'm not, I don't I, agree with that. I'm not on that train. <laughs> I'm not on that train. <laughs> she she wants to be called to she. I'm going to call her she. I just have a problem with the message and the messenger. So, well, let's, let's, you know, let's, I'm going to do two things. I want to re reiterate what Zoe said, which is the bifurcation of the courage to come forward after a lifetime as a male and a certain kind of a male versus did she deserve this award. Listen, the awards, what are award ceremonies except the opportunity to catch some eyes? And Especially the ESPN. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so ESPN, well, well done, ABC. Yeah. They did exactly what their job was, oh, to listen. attract eyes. They did it. That's what award ceremonies are for. But... In terms of the science behind gender uh, dysphoria, you, you're very familiar with that, Zoe. Very familiar. It's not about the chromosome. Excuse me, the chromosomes within we our both know nuclei. Yeah, chromosomes go ahead. don't necessarily mean you're male or female. Gender. 
with gender, gender identity. Go ahead. No, so Especially, what, but even so, you have a uh, thing like Kleinfelter's syndrome. So you don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated on genetics. Would you like to discuss the genetics? Or well, well, no, what no. What are your genetics? I, I, so I'd stay away from the genetics and back to the brain scans. You cut that out now or you'll go home in an ambulance. Yeah, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political discussion. There is a demonic spirit on back of these strings. It not only knows no identity in terms of heterosexual and homosexual, it knows of no identity among homosexuals themselves. If anyone does anything to bring into question, even on academic or scientific grounds, the complications of gender reassignment. Again, a hypocrisy that knows no bounds. Finally, back to the Middle East once again. This week in prophecy. Hamas has agreed to disband its administrative council, that is its functional government and work with, in fact, unite with the Palestinian Authority. This, of course, is carried out in the name of Palestinian Arab unity. In actual fact, the Palestinian Authority has held back funds for electricity payments, shutting the lights off in Gaza. In fact, it has cut subsidies to Hamas terrorist prisoners held by the Israelis. It has, in fact, exercised other economic instruments against Hamas and economically coerced Hamas into acquiescing to the demands of the Palestinian Authority. This situation has become very complicated and very interesting. The real human rights abuses of so-called Palestinian Arabs the real human rights abuses have been what Hamas and the Palestinian Authority have done to each other, killing far more of each other than anything can ever be said of the Israelis having to kill in self-defense. They have tortured each other in their partisan prisons. The human rights abuses are ecstatic, astounding. But by economic leverage, the Palestinian Authority is gaining the upper hand and doing so without any democratic input. Hamas has agreed, however, to some kind of elections, which of course will not be fair, will be rigged. A new figure emerges. His name is Mohammed Dalan, the security chief of Gaza, who has been negotiating with the Palestinian Authority in order to bring a new regime to power within Hamas that will get the lights turned back on. Now they window dress this, they sugarcoat it by talking about unity. It is simply the result of an economic coercion of Palestinian Arabs who are at war with each other. The real human rights abuses are what Muslim does to other Muslim. This week in prophecy, America and much of the rest of the world has been captivated by what's been taking place in the National Football League. It is a fact that the latest statistics, comprehensive studies, how reliable they are, we don't know, but they're not unreliable. They are certainly ballpark figures. Show that 65% of American people, 65% of the American public, do not agree with athletes kneeling during the national anthem. And 55% do not agree with the flag. I'm sorry. Sorry, stop that. 65% of the American public do not agree with the flag being disrespected at sporting events, and 55% do not agree with bending the knee during the national anthem. 70%, in fact, upwards of 70%, but conservatively 70% of the American public do not agree with the racialization or the politicization of professional sports. They don't like it. The NFL is losing viewership ratings, translating to tens of million dollars of lost revenue. You have the phenomena now of the Boston Patriots fans booing the team.
disrespectful to the United States, to the men that, 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 that served and fought for this country. It's a disgrace. They should be standing. I, I like what the president said. Yeah. If you're not going to stand for this country, you're fired. Yeah. Bell check, the crowd should do something about it. Fire them. That's what they should do. Of football fans of the Colts burning their season tickets. Things that would have been unthinkable that are going to hurt the NFL, going to hurt the team owners, and going to hurt the players themselves. The fact of the matter is most people in the United States think, believe, that protesting the flag and the national anthem is not protesting the president or a politician or the government. It's an act that disrespects the country, the nation. The flag is a symbol of the country and the nation, not of the president, not of the government, not of the administration. Do it on your own time, on your own turf. Those stadiums are paid for by taxpayer money largely. They are funded construction projects, often, often funded by the sale of municipal and state bonds. The taxpayers own that turf, and the majority of the taxpayers do not want it being used to dishonor the flag or the national anthem. It is often seen as an insult to veterans and those who have lost their lives in the defense of the country, lost limbs, sight, etc., eyesight, etc. The public is against them. This has been a political victory for President Donald Trump unquestionably. 70% of the people do not want this. It is hurting the sport financially and it is hurting the players themselves. What people who are millionaires are complaining about justice for, as if they're somehow the victims of it, is absolutely ludicrous. They have the right to protest, say most people, but do it on your own time and on your own turf. Don't do it at the games where the fans are the customers, where the stadium is the property of the taxpayer. But looking at this from a scriptural perspective, what does it come to? It's the same thing about building the so-called wall. Even though the biggest victims of illegal immigration are Hispanic Americans and Afro Americans, who have their jobs taken from them and who see wage scales artificially depressed by illegal immigration, it's been racialized by the media and by the left for political purposes. They don't really care about Hispanics. If they did, they'd be standing up for the jobs of Hispanic Americans. They don't care about Afro-Americans. If they did, they'd be standing up for their jobs and their wages. It's not about that. These people are simply being manipulated. Ignorant people being manipulated by political bosses and a corrupt media. But looking at it scripturally, Ethnon against ethnon, goy against goy, ethnic nation against ethnic nation. In Africa, it's tribalism. Everywhere we go, we see it is nation against nation, ethnic nation against ethnic nation, and this is getting worse. There are those who play this card for their own financial and political gain. We had Spike Lee, the American filmmaker, saying that franchise owners of American football teams are like plantation owners. I never knew of a plantation owner who, pay, who paid his slaves two, three, four, and five million dollars a year, and I never knew of a plantation owner who had white slaves. But this is Spike Lee. When you're not making successful movies anymore at the box office with Hollywood in its worst recession, probably in its history, you have to find another business. So Spike Lee has gone into the race business. If you can't succeed in film, you go into another business. This is absurd. It is all based on race aquatic vehemence. It's based on the people who have a financial or political or career interest in bringing division for their own aggrandizement. But it does the society 
as a whole no good and does the nation no good, yet it's what the word of God said will happen. It doesn't matter if it's in Kurdistan. It doesn't matter if it's in tribal Africa. It doesn't matter if it's in the United States, if it's Hispanics, blacks, whites. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's Arab and African immigration into Europe. It doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus said. Nation will rise against nation. Resulting in political conflicts, kingdom against kingdom. This will be a sign of this coming. Thank you so much for listening. This has been This Week in Prophecy. My name is James J. Kapash. God bless you. And please tell somebody about the Lord Jesus and his salvation this week.